My name is Kendi Snangel and I'm a manager with the investment banking unit here at Barita Investments. And today we're going to be talking about alternative investments. Here with me is a key subject matter expert, Mr. Kirk Douglas, manager, alternative investments and structured products. Welcome, Kirk. Thanks, Kendi. Um, it's been um, a long time coming up. As Kendi said, I'm Kurt Douglas, the manager of Alternative Investments and Structured Finance here at Barita Investments Limited. And really what that means is I'm in charge of um, basically leading Barita's foyer into the alternative investment space. Funny enough, with alternative investments, you have the buy side and the sell side. So I'm just going to be having a conversation with you about both sides of alternative investments. Okay. All right. So, so Kirk, I'm in investment banking. You're in alternative investments. They're quite similar in a lot of ways, but they're also very different. Tell us a bit about those similarities and differences. Sure. So let me start with the differences first. Mm -hmm. So the difference is alternative investments, you would consider it everything as that's non-traditional. So everything outside the typical stocks and bonds. So whether that be gold or real estate or artwork or derivatives, which basically is a combination of the traditional and the non-traditional. Um, so that's the difference. The similarities, however, is in stuff like structuring. So typically with investment banking, you know, you provide services for your corporate clients. So whether they want to go um, the private markets or they want to IPO, or they want a little debt, they want a little equity. What the similarities now with alternative investments is we can provide alternative investment solutions for those corporate clients. Mm -hmm. So we can provide private equity, private credit, and we can even fuse and incorporate the traditional with the non-traditional so we can walk um, a corporate client along the pipeline. So with private credit or, or private debt or private equity into the traditional investment banking where they go the um, IPO route. Okay. All right. So what I'm getting is that investment banking is typically more traditional type assets and securities, whereas alternative investments, alternative the name, it lends itself <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the name, non-traditional. Yeah, non -traditional. Um, so underlined by, you know, assets that are, are less common and, mm -hmm. and, and less used in the industry. Okay. Okay. So what do what kind of clients look for alternative investments as opposed to your standard bond or investment banking transaction? So the funny thing, um, Candy, that you mentioned, what kind of clients, but alternative investments is open to all clients. Mm -hmm. So big, small, medium, all clients, they're alternative investment solutions for all clients. So typically what we look for um, before any alternative investment solution, we kind of look at what is the track record of the company? What does the company want to achieve? Mm -hmm. And then we have a fit for purpose solution. So normally what I like to say about alternative investments, you can call it fit for purpose investment. And on the other hand now, alternative investment um, options are out there for our, our clients as well who want to get some sort of exposure to alternative investments. So I'm not a corporate client. I don't have a small, medium or large business. Mm -hmm. Probably entrepreneurship is not for me. However, I'm hearing about this alternative investments thing and I want to get some amount of exposure. So what my role um, involves is um, the packaging of alternative investment products for um, persons who want to get exposure to alternative investments. Mm -hmm. Right, and that, that ties into what you said as, you know, Alternative investments kind of falling under the, the investment banking umbrella. Mm -hmm. Part of our our role here at Barita is to connect, you know, the issue of securities with potential investors, right? right? So connecting those who have capital with those who need capital. Um, right. And so when you're you're looking at both the buy side and the sell side, we spoke a bit about the the sell side being, you know, issues of securities, looking for solutions where alternative investments come into play. But tell us a little bit more about the, the buy side. So what why might an investor want to get into alternative investments? 
a couple of reasons. Um, I, I, can, I can give two main reasons. Mm-hmm. So capital accumulation and capital protection. So normally the returns for alternative investments are more long-tailed. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for more long-tailed um, returns, if you're looking for something that's going to pay off mm-hmm. later down the line, um, also capital protection. So we are approaching or we're in the midst of some amount of economic uncertainty. You want to protect the little that you have. Alternative investments are not necessarily um, strongly correlated with the traditional investments. So, you know, the equity market kind of taking a little beat up um, with the high interest rate environment when prices are going down. The alternative investment space or alternative investment assets do not necessarily share um, the same correlation with the traditional assets. So it forms or it, it gives some amount of um, capital protection for, for, for clients. Mm-hmm. All right, so we've been talking a little bit about, you know, what, what are alternative investments? I want us to, to make it more applicable to our clients. I want our clients to be able to identify alternative, what are alternative investments? Um, have there been any alternative investments in the market, you know, recently? You know, I know we just went through COVID, which was a bit of a down period for, for most, you know, investors. But either, you know, prior or um, post-COVID, have there been any alternative investments in the market that people may have you know, taking part in, they may have invested in, but they didn't know that it's alternative investments. Give us an, an example of one or two. Sure, I can give a, a couple of examples. So, as I mentioned, with alternative investments, it's, you know, everything that's not traditional. Right. And this example that I'm going to give is, it's, it's the mix of the traditional with the non-traditional. But the first example I'm going to give is, remember when I said, um, a mix between the traditional and non-traditional. So in March 2020, right on the cusp of COVID, we had the Trans Jamaica IPO, which was um, a public-private partnership with the government of Jamaica. While it's traditional in the sense that it's equity, it's an IPO, and a lot of persons would, a lot of our investors would be familiar with IPO, okay. IPOs. It's alternative investments in the in the fact that um, what you're investing in, the underlying, it's an infrastructure project. Um, so it is not the, the, the traditional which we're used to. It's, it's mm-hmm. non-traditional in terms of the flows and all of that. So another one that I'm going to give is something we did internally at Barita where we, um, we did a private credit solution for one of our clients and we were able to sell that private credit solution to um, clients who are looking to invest in alternative investments. So what you have is the opportunity for, um, in general, um, the persons in the market who are looking to invest in alternative investments, Mm -hmm. we are able to provide that solution with a mix of the traditional and also the non-traditional, like we uh, examples that I provided. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, looking at the stock market, for example, you know, mm-hmm. we see a lot of companies within the manufacturing and distribution industry, within the finance industry, but we really don't see a lot of companies that are involved in infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Um, Transdram being one of one of the first and and one of the few that I can think of. But that's good to know. So, um, given that the underlying assets are a bit non-traditional, as you just said. How does that impact risk? What does the risk look like for the investors in an alternative investment? Funny enough, that was something I was hoping that we'd discuss. So what I want to to, to, to speak about is risk-adjusted returns. Mm -hmm. So the risk-adjusted returns for alternative investments, when you check it out, the risk-adjusted returns are actually better than traditional investments. Okay. It comes with risk, mm-hmm. no As doubt. Most investments do. But risk reward. Mm-hmm. So when you check the risk adjusted returns, you have a better risk adjusted return profile. Okay. So, however, what I want to speak about as well is that in an assessment of the perfect alternative investment solution and the alternative investment opportunity, mm-hmm. one has to. Um, look at what risk appetite they are or it's risk appetite bucket they fall in mm-hmm. so i am more of a i'm more a risk seeking individual i'm young i'm 
20s young. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I can look for a private equity solution. I can hold it for a couple of years, knowing that on the back end, um, as I spoke about a little bit earlier, the long tail returns mm-hmm. um, and uh, some sweet risk adjusted returns. I am, let's say, I am not so young, not so 20s anymore. <laughs> a I'm bit more looking, conservative. I'm we'll looking say. for something more conservative. I'm looking for some exposure to real estate, whether directly investing in real estate or um, looking for an investment that gives me exposure to real estate, Mm -hmm. like say the Barita Real Estate Fund. Okay. Okay, so you you touched on, you'd have mentioned, I think, about three things that fall into alternative investment space. So you mentioned infrastructure, you would have mentioned real estate, and I think at um, the beginning you'd have mentioned gold. We just talked about risk-adjusted returns. How do the risks for those three that I just mentioned differ? Real estate seems to be very popular these days. You know, um, we have quite a boom going on here in Jamaica. Um, not much on the gold front, on the gold front <laughs> quite yet, and we're getting there with infrastructure. Where do you see, you know, uh, opportunities for for higher returns? So, um, starting with gold first, precious materials. I'm an admirer of gold. <laughs> not real. Um, <laughs> so, on on the precious material side, mm-hmm. um, strictly from a Jamaican context, it's a bit harder to get into so it's a bit harder to quantify the risk the typical literature speaks to you know in times of crisis or economic downturn gold is normally a safe haven whether persons in invest in um, a gold back index or um, gold bullion um, the actual physical um, representation of the gold or um, any any form of company that probably does gold mining that's a bit harder to get into. Mm-hmm. So the risks um, are a bit harder to quantify. Okay. In terms of infrastructure projects, let's look at like Transjam per se. The risk, um, in terms of quantifying the risk, where the risk presents is in the management, the initial setup and the management of the infrastructure project. Mm-hmm. So what persons have to be mindful about is what is the capabilities of the management team behind the infrastructure project somebody who has done it time and time again, done it time over, Mm -hmm. the risk would be um, less than somebody who is just starting because infrastructure projects, they take significant capital outlay. Also infrastructure projects take a lot of expertise to manage. Right. Now real estate, which you know, you walk down the road, everybody said, so the apartment going up for how much million? Real estate is, is, is kind of a big thing now in Jamaica. Uh-huh. The risk there now is one, you have to know what type of real estate you're getting into. You're getting into the rental market. Airbnbs are popular now. Um, persons talking about buy, renovate, flip, or person just talking about buying for wealth preservation. So each sector of the real estate market has a different risk profile. Mm -hmm. And in terms of how risky, it depends again on your personal goals and as well as the the market that you are trying to play in. So let's say you're going into the Airbnb and the rental space. The risk is getting the clientele to come in the Airbnbs. The risk is getting the persons to rent. Um, Is it that the rental payments can um, be more than what you're paying in terms of for the mortgage? Mm -hmm. Um, If you're looking at the buy, renovate, flip, sell, how fast can you have that moving? What's the, what's the, what's the, the length between closing the purchase? renovating and then closing the The turnover yeah so what's the turnover there Mm -hmm. so that's where the risk comes in and um, personally i believe there's there's some amount of of latency and friction in that section of the market so um, if i was to give a professional assessment that would be a little more risky than the other sections of the market Okay, thanks Kirk. I think you made some some very good points there. So let me put myself in the shoes of an investor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, as you say, I drive down the road and I see all this real estate going up. I see all these, you know, roadworks, new highways. How 
how do I get exposure to those? How, what, what kind of, what kind of products? Who do I go to? What do I look for? What kind, what kind of investments can I, can I use to diversify my portfolio and give me access to these alternative investments? All right. So, what I want to ask: How much money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so seriously though, <laughs> it depends on um, what exactly your goal is. Of you just want to get some exposure. Mm -hmm. You don't have the 40 million for the apartment, mm -hmm. but you want the exposure. You see that there is a nice real estate, a vibrant real estate market. You want the exposure. What asset can get you the exposure? You have to look. I, let's say, for example, I can't necessarily get that 40 million apartment. I can't right. necessarily buy that 20 million piece of land. Not yet, at least. Not yet, at <laughs> least. <laughs> Where can I go for the exposure? You, you, I, I want to, to just plug the, the, the Barita Real Estate Fund. Barita's real estate fund has a nice um, property portfolio in some very key areas around around Jamaica mm -hmm. where the intention is to have those properties um, develop those properties and have the investors in the Barita Real Estate Fund benefit from the appreciation in value of those properties. That's an opportunity and a very lucrative opportunity for persons who want to get exposure to the real estate space. Mm -hmm. And um, similarly to that, for persons who are looking at that space, try to look at what asset can get me um, some amount of exposure to that space. Uh, you're investing in a company, the company is letting you know that, hey, we are trying to foray into that. You go um, have an initial foray into the real estate space. Mm -hmm. You look at the company's track record with real estate. You look at, look at the company's current real estate portfolio. You're pleased with what they have done. You have assessed the risk of what they say they're going to do. Have an investment, an initial investment in that company and then benefit from those returns. Okay. Good. So, so as an investor, um, depending on you know my risk profile and you know the funds that I currently have available to invest, you're saying I can either get direct exposure to alternative investments, you know whether I take a stake in a company whose business is infrastructure or real estate development, or you're saying that I can you know go to an investment bank like Barito, look at their funds and see you know which of these funds kind of pool together alternative investments, you know, um, different real estate properties, etc. But guys, you heard it here first. Visit Barita. Come talk to us about our real estate funds. Okay, Kurt, so you mentioned some more common forms of alternative investments or more common assets that underlie alternative investments. I noticed you mentioned art. Tell, tell me a little bit more about that. How, how, how does art tie in with alternative investments? Sure. So this is how it ties in. So Historically, art has been a great way to transfer wealth. So persons have bought various pieces of art, um, particularly in Europe, that's where it mainly started. And um, these, these art pieces increase in value over time as the, either the subject matter that they had um, represented gets more prominence. Um, an exa example, let's say for example, an art piece called Liberty Leading the People. So that, that subject matter of um, fight for freedom mm. becomes um, more prominent. The art piece reflecting same increases in value. I haven't um, invested or bought that art piece. I can transfer that wealth down a couple of generations. And if we look now locally, pieces by um, persons such as um, Edna Manley or Karl Parbusing have significant cultural um, importance and impact also pieces by Malachi Copper Reynolds. So that significant cultural impact is just captured and persons will invest in that. And then as those, uh, either the, the, what they have captured become more relevant mm -hmm. or as we reflect on the life and the time of the artist, their work becomes more popular and it becomes more important and the value increases mm -hmm. and then you're able to either pass down that value or sell it so it's simple just like the the rules of fundamental investing you buy low you sell high right so you invest in the art now and um later down when there's significant in, um increases in cultural importance mm -hmm. then that's how the increase in value for the art comes 
can either pass it down generations or you can have it sold at an auction or sold to somebody else. Wow, wow. Thank you for, for raising that because it takes me into my next point that I wanted to, to delve a bit into, which is, you know, you have mentioned that alternative investments are less influenced by broader market trends. And I think mm -hmm. using art as, as an example of alternative investments is a perfect demonstration of that. Um, COVID would, would have just come out of COVID recently. And I, I don't think COVID would impact the price <laughs> of art, right? Mm -hmm. um, so knowing that, you know, prior to COVID, I, you know, if I would have invested in, um, you know, uh, an artist that I see, you know, um, growing and developing into the future, into, you know, one of, one of our generation's great artists, mm -hmm. um, it's highly unlikely that COVID or, you know, um, any other market trend or or hiccup in the um, economy that we see is likely to impact art. So so thanks for pointing that one out, Kirk. Yeah, yeah man. And um, more on the the, the correlation mm -hmm. or the thereof between alternative investments and current market conditions or right. market conditions overall. The the economic uncertainty that sometimes we're plagued with mm -hmm. with um, different parts of the business cycle, the boom and the bust, you can look for some amount of constant um, leveling for alternative investments. And then the, um, further down the line, as I said, the long tail returns, that's when you know you get the returns so stable throughout mm -hmm. and then you get the returns. Okay, wow. All right, thank you. So sticking on that topic of you know market trends, Give us a brief overview of where we are currently in the market, right? Like what would have happened in the past three years? You know, we had COVID, things were up, things were down. What happened and where are we right now? So, a lot happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> Understatement of the year. <laughs> so, let, let, let me take us back to March of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, the buzz around the Transjam IPO and then the fear of COVID. You know, we had the lockdowns. And then persons were really uncertain about what is happening, what's going on. So you had an asset sell-off. Persons are, you know, selling their stocks because they want to keep as much cash as they can, or they want to buy all of the tissue paper to the supermarket <laughs> because they don't know when lockdown is gonna end. So we had an, an asset sell-off that created a unique opportunity for persons to invest, as I said earlier, buy low, sell high to invest in those quality companies that they see will be able to, you know, withstand um, whatever pressures COVID might, might, might carry. So we had a rebound in the, the stock market in 2021. And then something which probably hasn't happened in a very long while happened in the latter half of 2021, where it seemed as if the economy was overheating because of all the money that was circulating in, in the economy, both locally and abroad. Whether this was just because of persons um, coming out of lockdown and spending more, or the different stimulus packages which locally and abroad would have been implemented, there was um, a lot of money floating around chasing too few goods. So that led to inflation, which persons are saying, oh, it's just gonna, um, it's just gonna pass through. Um, it's not persistent. It's just transitory. Where we faced a situation in which we did not fully um, quantify the risk to persistent inflation. Mm -hmm. So some central banks moves, move really quickly. Some central banks are monetary, monetary authorities move slowly. So the BOJ, our central bank, move really quickly to start increasing um, the benchmark policy rate. And what the benchmark policy rate is, it's the rate at which um, the BOJ um, would, would set where banks borrow and lend the money. So with the benchmark policy rate being increased, that's a signal to the market that, hey, there is an extra reward for keeping, you know, just keeping a little bit of money in reserve. Mm -hmm. It's a form of moral suasion where they try to signal to the market that, hey, we're realizing that, you know, mm -hmm. things are getting out of control. So inflation was above the, four, the, the, the band that the BOJ set of 46%. So they increased the policy rate to try and um, have uh, fewer um, amounts of money floating mm -hmm. around in the economy. So this adversely 
affected the stock market. So the stock market get a beat in a can. <laughs> so increasing interest rates, so interest bearing products mm -hmm. that the, the Bank of Jamaica offers like their CDs, those products started bearing a higher rate of interest forcing persons to save more than they spend, mm -hmm. to invest more than they spend. So these assets that the BOJ tend to offer, they are sometimes seen as substitute for stocks. So if I can get a 6% CD from the BOJ. CD a being a certificate of certificate deposit. Of deposit, a 30 day, 6% 30 day certificate of deposit. I'm going to take that guaranteed money rather than put it on a stock which would have a longer um, return horizon mm -hmm. so it's that phenomenon that we would have experienced and that we're still currently experiencing because rates are still elevated because we're not fully out of the woods yet mm -hmm. so the stock market would have slowed a bit it re rebounded in 2021 but slowed a bit in 2022 and would have been flat in 2023 off the back of covid high interest rates and economic uncertainty mm. Wow, 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 wow. So, okay, so we, we mentioned, you know, we're kind of on the tail end of what we hope this economic uncertainty is. But as an investor, again, putting myself in investor shoes, um, you know, 2019, I don't think any of us saw COVID coming, not many people did. What could I have been doing as a regular part of my investment strategy that would have protected my investments, right? Because I mean, mainly let's say, you know, my portfolio tends to be a bit heavier on the on the stocks, right? I would have taken a significant loss during the past three years when the stock market was down. Um, what could I have been doing prior to, to COVID that would have kind of protected my investments or protected my money? Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of things. Um, and what I want to emphasize and start with is um, defining your goal clearly. Why am I investing? What mm -hmm. do I want? Am I investing to get rich tomorrow? <laughs> am I investing for um, you know the tuition of my siblings? Am I investing for the tuition of my child? Define your goal clearly. Right. And out of that clearly defined goal, it's easier to have an investment strategy. Mm -hmm. And most of us, uh, I would say, would probably, I, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but most of us would be investing to have um, this thing about, you know, generational wealth. Yes. So investing for wealth accumulation. So what, what you could have done as an investor is, one, clearly define your goals. Two, do your research and speak with the professionals. So you can speak with the professionals, but I encourage you to do your research as well. Three, invest in quality companies or quality um, investment products. And four, and what I'm going to encourage persons to do is stay invested. The market isn't a short game. It isn't invest today, rich tomorrow. It's stay invested and achieving your investment goals. Mm -hmm. Kirk, thanks. You, you, just, you just made a very important point there, which was staying invested in the long term. I know sometimes investors can get anxious, right? Like putting myself in an investor's shoes. You know, maybe I would have been investing in stocks prior to COVID. COVID happened. I don't have a particularly, you know, strong background in finance, but I'm thinking to myself, hmm, a lot, a lot seems to be happening in the market. You know, it seems like stocks may, may take a turn. You know, the, the stock market may go down. So I decide to liquidate my stocks and, and put my money in my, my bank account, my savings account, right? You just mentioned policy interest rates go up. So I'm expecting to see a little bump in my, in my savings account. Mm -hmm. If I were to have stayed in, stayed, left my money alone, left it in my bank account for, you know, the next three, five years, how would that compare to if I had invested my money in one of Barita's unit trust funds or in one of our funds um, that gives me exposure to alternative investments? What would that have looked like in the long term? All right, so those are some 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 very strong and great points. And I know investors are worried and they're, they're concerned mm -hmm. about what happens next. Right. And you know, 
what should I do next? And we are um, telling our investors to stay invested. So what we actually did, um, you know, just to show to our investors how strong of a strategy it is to stay invested, is we did an analysis where, you know, an investor throughout the troubling times about a decade ago, um, what would your returns have looked like had, had you stayed invested versus, you know, your deposit monthly into your savings account. So, you know, the, over the past 10 years, we would have experienced stuff such as um, the JDX, the NDX, which is um, Jamaica Debt, Ex Debt Exchange and the National Debt Exchange, which are two significant um, financial events, which would have had um, ripple effects for um, the financial markets, you know, whether it is there's some amount of financial uncertainty about what would happen after NDX and JDX. There would have been periods of some, some amount of turbulence and inflation, as well as fluctuation in um, the benchmark policy rates. So that was a period of a lot of economic uncertainty, just like now is. Mm -hmm. And what we realized, if you were to you know, pull all your money, put all your money in your savings account across that horizon, versus if you were to put your money in um, the Barita um, money market fund and the cap growth fund over the period what we realize is that you would have significantly outperformed any returns that you would have generated from your savings account if you were to take the approach of staying invested and investing in the Barita cap growth and money market fund over the long period so those returns would have outpaced what you could have earned in the savings account and um, that approach of staying invested, um, I believe, may serve investors very well for the coming times. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kirk. Um, I think it's very important because I know investors tend to get nervous when you know things in the in the market or the economy change. Right? We'll, everybody wants their money to be making the most for them. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody wants to make a dollar from ten cents. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Right. So, so you know, when we see things happening in the market, we tend to want to to move to something that we think is is safer. But what you're saying to what you're saying now is that you know, if we have our money, you know, in in one of Barita's funds, the money market fund or the cap growth fund, you know, when we see things changing in the market, that may not be the best time to move. It may be best to just keep the money where it's at you know on in these funds and look at it later down the line after things have have evened out a, a bit yeah man so despite the turbulence despite the uncertainty remember your goal and stay invested for the long term okay okay well we're gonna work on being a little less anxious wow <laughs> <laughs> we know with these things that are happening in the market and and staying invested in the long term so that we can really see those returns thank you so much kirk i feel like you made some really great points you know introducing us to alternative investments i'm sure you know people would have bought into the transjam ipo and they didn't realize that that in and of itself is an alternative investment because of the exposure that it gives you to infrastructure um you know we really want to encourage our investors to as you say yes consult with their professional advisors but also to do their own research you know find the opportunities that are out there because as you mentioned there are you know more opportunities than we even thought i can invest in art today mm -hmm. um and you know those those artworks that you see up in your in your parents and your grandparents house may be worth a pretty penny it, it's gathering cobwebs now but the returns are there yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> the returns can be there so we spoke you you spoke a bit about the investment opportunities that are out there for retail investors but i'd like for you to tell us a bit more about the opportunities that are out there for our high net worth clients and and corporate and um corporate clients and institutions uh yeah man sure so this now covers the structured finance part of the job job title so the opportunities that exist i'm going to start with the corporate clients you know to lead with an example a client came to us you know looking to raise funding and um, it was a candid conversation they with came the to you and not me <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a candid conversation with the client you know um hey do you think now is a good time to be you know raising funds do you think now is a good time to be seeking money and you know Joking, I said to the client, I don't know anybody who doesn't want more money. <laughs> so um, what we did for the client is we looked at the client's um, financial statements. We looked at the cash flows for the client, what they're expecting and uh, cash flows in the past. 
and we looked at the strategic goal for the client as to why is it that they want to raise additional funding mm-hmm. and what we were able to structure for the client is a, a mechanism where, where in which they were able to raise the funding which was not a burden on their cash flow it would not eat out at the profits that they're looking um, to, 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 to generate with whatever they were taking the funds to do. So the opportunity exists where you can have alternative investment solutions to their capital financing needs. Whether it be um, a solution where, you know, there's an equity injection where, you know, they don't have to pay out any dividends initially, or it's a private credit solution where there is a moratorium on the interest payments for a little while. Let's say, for example, they're building a warehouse it could take 18 months for the warehouse to build. There can be um, an alternative investment solution where there is no direct outlay of um, cash interest payments for that 18 months, just just for example. Mm -hmm. So those are the solutions that we have available for our corporate clients. On the other side now, opportunities that we have for our high net worth and even our institutional clients is the opportunity to invest in um, Barita brokered and structured structured products or structured notes where in which, in which this is a, a buzz term sorry to, sorry to just call it a buzz term but where we securitize um, either assets or cash flow cash flows of certain assets and package that as a note to um, our clients so essentially have an asset all right we like the flows that of, of this asset right we can purchase the asset and um, give our clients exposure to the cash flows of the asset mm. via way of securitizing the asset the client invests with us and they now are paid um, direct interest based on the cash flows from that asset so that's another way in which opportunities exi- opportunities exist for clients to get exposure to alternative investments. So I want our clients to be on the lookout, you know, speak with your Barita rep, speak with your Barita advisor, speak with your Barita investment manager and ask them about, you know, hey, what are the structured product uh, structured product opportunities um, that Barita comes with from time to time? You may never know, something might be there just for you. Great, great. Um, I don't mind if you don't mind me asking. Um, you mentioned securitizing assets. What are some examples of assets that you would have done, you would have used for some structured products recently, or or just in the past generally? So, remember we were talking about real estate. So very recently we were able to securitize a prime um, piece of real estate, and the flows that we are expecting from the development of that real estate. We were able to securitize that and offer it um, mm. to, to our clients. So there's another way in which clients can de- yeah. get exposure to real estate. Yeah. So we'll, we mentioned the funds and now you're here saying that, you know, from time to time, you guys will do structured products for, for investors that are looking for the kind of exposure that we were talking about. Okay, awesome. So thank you so much, Kirk, for those words of wisdom and insight into alternative investments. No problem. It was fun. Great. Thank you. And we'll definitely have you back again. Hopefully soon.